Welcome to Lecture 3 of Advanced Microeconomics with me, Dr. Craig Webb. In today's lecture, we're going to be studying something called adverse selection and how this can arise as a consequence of asymmetric information in a market. These are in fact very old ideas, but they were crystallised in George Akerlof's famous paper, The Market for Lemons, for which Akerlof was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics. Let's start with a bit of history about this idea of adverse selection. So let's begin the lecture in a very classy way with a reading of some ancient Greek poetry. So this is an, well, I've edited it, but it's from Aristophanes' play, The Frogs, from 405 BC, so two and a half thousand years ago. Um, let me read this for you. It has often struck our notice that the course our city runs is the same towards men and money. She has true and worthy sons. She has good and ancient silver, yet we never use them. So with men we know for upright, blameless lives and noble names. These we spurn for men of brass. So, What's the point of this uh, poetry reading? Well, this contains an observation that's going to be very important for our lecture. It's saying there's something very similar about the way that men or the workforce, labor force is used in this city and the way money is used. There's good money, um, ancient gold and silver coins, well minted, and there is uh, poor money, so forged money, um, and it's the forged money that gets used. So the good coins don't circulate, but the poor quality coins do circulate. And this is said to be the same as the way that men are treated. There are great men or great workers, perhaps, upright, blameless lives and noble names. And these are not used. So the city makes most use of these men of brass. So the perhaps low quality workers. Um, so this is uh, an idea that we're going to call adverse selection. So um, adverse selection, we're going to think of a market mechanism in our study. Um, and the market is going to select, for instance, who gets employed and who doesn't get employed. And it's going to select what types of money circulate and what types of money do not circulate, and so on. And the adverse part of this uh, notion of adverse selection essentially is saying it's choosing the wrong types. It's choosing the low quality, um, the low quality types over the high quality types. So we're going to call this intuitive idea adverse selection. And note that two and a half thousand years ago, we knew about this, okay? The same idea has been expressed throughout history. So it appears in the Bible, in the Talmud, in Islamic texts from the 13th century. Uh, Oresme said something similar in the 14th century and Copernicus in the 16th century. And MacLeod in the 19th century uh, also commented on the same idea of adverse selection. He called the idea Gresham's Law. Uh, now, Gresham's Law is uh, the idea that bad money drives out the good. So um, that idea of bad money driving out the good, let me just comment on why, on how that happens. Um, now, I'm not sure this is so much the case nowadays, but certainly uh, when I was uh, younger, and I was a teenager in the 1990s, Whenever you went to a shop and you got, say, um, a bunch of one pound coins in change, so if you got, say, uh, eight or nine one pound coins, you were almost guaranteed to have a fake one pound coin in your pocket. And they were very easy to detect. You could just rub the coins together and some of the gold would just rub away and you could see this uh, dull metal underneath. So what did you do when you got hold of a fake one pound coin? Well, essentially, you spent it as quickly as possible to pass it on, to get rid of it. So you've got good money in your pocket and bad money in your pocket. You make sure that you spend the bad money. 
So Gresham's law just captures that idea. It says the more we have bad money in circulation, it's going to drive out the good money. People will hold on to the good money and won't spend it because they want to get rid of their bad money. And so bad money is the only type of money that ends up circulating. Now for some more recent history. In 1966, a an economic student, George Akerlof, writes a paper, The Market for Lemons, Quality, Uncertainty, and the Market Mechanism. Now, when we say lemons here, this isn't referring to the fruit lemon. It's an American term for um, a car that uh, is very likely to break. So in English, we might say a banger, and the market for bangers maybe, or death traps. But in America, they say lemons for this kind of poor quality car. Um, so the market for lemons was about the used car market and looked at the question of why are used cars, why are secondhand cars sold at such lower prices than brand new cars? Okay. Um, now we're going to look at that question um, more specifically later on. But let's get back to the history. So Akerlof writes the paper and he submits it to several of the top journals in economics. The paper is famously rejected by three journals. Uh, and in a quote from Akerlof later on describing the referee reports, apparently one of them said something long, along the lines of, the review does not publish such trivial stuff, referring to the, economic, the American Economic Review, which is the very top journal in all of economics, even today. Eventually, in 1970, the paper is published, in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. Um, so this, this has become the stuff of legend, for especially for PhD students in economics who are trying to get published. This paper is rejected three times. Eventually, it finds a home. How is the paper viewed today? Well, here is an extract from NobelPrize.org. Of course, Akerlof was awarded the Nobel Prize for this paper, and they summarize his contribution as follows. Akerlof's 1970 essay is the single most important study in the literature on economics of information. It has the typical features of a truly seminal contribution. It addresses a simple but profound and universal idea with numerous implications and widespread applications. Let's mention here that the main result in Akerlof's paper is that if we have a perfectly functioning competitive market with all uh, decision makers perfectly rational um, and understanding the risks involved, if, if there is uncertainty about the quality of a good, in particular in the sense of asymmetric information, so I know whether I'm selling you something high quality or low quality, but you have no idea whether it's high quality or low quality. If we're in a situation of asymmetric information, then the equilibrium necessarily involves this uh, idea of adverse selection. The market will select the poor quality goods to be circulated and sold and the high quality types of goods simply won't get sold. It's reasonable to ask at this stage, given that the idea of adverse selection has been known for many centuries, why is it that Akerlof was awarded the Nobel Prize for presenting these ideas in the 1970s? Well, there's a big difference between empirical observations, simply noticing something that seems to keep happening, and developing a formal theory of competitive markets with rational behavior and identifying the precise cause that if there is asymmetric information in these markets, then adverse selection not only happens, but it is inevitable. It cannot be avoided. So this is quite different to simply noticing that adverse selection seems to keep happening. We're able to predict where and when it will happen. We're able to make strong predictions about the types of trades that occur in markets and also explain why some markets may not even exist. Before we um, study the model formally, we're going to need some tools from statistics, in particular 
uh, working with continuous uniform random variables. So I've prepared a what you might consider a technical appendix video for you to recap these basic skills before starting our proper study of Akerlof's model.